Mary. We have lots of stars to share with you tonight. The first person I'm going to be interviewing will actually be interviewing um, uh, Waddick Doyle tonight, and that is Lee Hebner, who is a member of the AUP board, but is actually much more famous for being the publisher and CEO for, I believe, 14 years of the International Herald Tribune. He was also a former president of AUP. He was the dean of the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University and a professor at Medill, the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern, which was his alma mater. He's also well known to all of us as having been a speechwriter for Nixon and for the Yaga Khan. And Lee was president at the time when he decided AUP needed a school of global communications and he asked Waddick to come in and the rest is history. Waddick Doyle, as Mary said, a star professor. He's been both mother and father to generations of students at AUP going back to his first year. Sometimes he was the father and Berna Hubner, Lee's wife was the mother of students who took advantage and were able to come to Paris as part of the CC program. And sometimes Sinead Foley, who's on this call, she was the mother and Waddick was the father of many, many of our students over the years when Global Communications was being founded um, and the graduate program was developed and it became one of our largest majors. Waddick is a typical AUP global explorer in that he's both Irish and Australian, um, also kind of French in a really interesting way, but probably, uh, I don't think we can say in any way American. Definitely European, definitely Australian, definitely Irish, a wonderful mixture of all of them. He has a passion for French television and Italian television, both of which he writes on as part of his scholarly work. He's interested in religion, comparative religion, and teaches course on courses on branding and belief and other things like that. Teaches narrative analysis and semiotics, which comes out of a lot of his graduate work at, I believe, was it at Bologna or at Griffiths in, in Bologna. Australia? Bologna. Both. both. Both, at both, actually. And uh, when he came to Paris to do postdoctoral studies, he went to the Ecole des Hautes Etudes de Sciences Sociales. And from there, we were lucky enough to be able to bring him to, to, to AUP. Wadik has been the builder of so many things at AUP and we've worked together in the trenches going back several decades now. And he's one of our most wonderful and most um, generous teachers. So of course he invited two of his students to join us today. And you'll also be hearing from Kim Chekanetsa, who is, has her own show on the BBC on women in leadership and brings in different women each week to interview. And I hope she'll say a little bit of the path from AUP to the BBC. And we also have Narman El Furijani, who's gonna join us today, who just graduated from the program not a few weeks ago. And we're hoping to keep her at AUP working with us for a little while still to come. So I'm gonna stop right there and hand it over to Lee, who I believe will be interviewing Wadik, and then Wadik will be presenting our wonderful alumni. Well, thanks, I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I, I would just begin by saying thanks to Celeste and also to Mary for putting together these programs that have been wonderful ways to stay in touch with AUP, even for those of us who can't actually be in Paris as much as we might want to be. Um, I briefly served as president at AUP during an interval between two presidents. The former president, Glenn Ferguson, had to step down because of bad health. It took us a while to find the right new president, and in that two-year interim, I was in this role, and one of the first things that happened to me, I had come from Northwestern University, which had a very active uh, communications school and had for many decades. And I must have raised the question with Paul Gott, our, our provost dean at the time of faculties, uh, what, what kind of communication programs do we have going here and should we try to expand this? And he came back a couple of days later and said, well, there's a person by the name of Roddick Doyle who might be interested in joining us. And I've always said in all the jobs I've had, the one qualification is not saying no to a good idea. And this was a great idea. We met Waddick and asked him to join us. And maybe he should take up the story from the first question would be, uh, or you Waddick, if you could to reminisce a bit about how you got this all going, what your vision was, uh, what you ran into is you tried to set up a whole new program at AUP. It's always hard to do that because I think existing faculty worry that their majors will be reduced in number if a new or big program is introduced. But I, I know through the years, 
everybody, and I knew at AUP, just welcomed the fact that Wadi had come on with such energy and vision and helped to put this thing together. So with that brief comment and the hope that you will post your questions on the chat box and join in asking them, I'll uh, ask Wadi to, to comment. Well, there's a lot to say, and how to say it quickly. I think one most important thing for universities is to be distinctive. You know, there's thousands out there, and the important thing is to have something that you give that somehow represents who you really are. And, um, you know, I went to university in the 70s, and there was a sort of domination of two schools. On one hand, a sort of liberal free market, on the other hand, a left wing um, Marxist type of view. And um, I always thought there was something wrong with both of them. And of course, those theories dominated how we saw value, what we saw as valuable. And so um, both of them, and to some extent, reflected a lack of humanity, of recognition of, of humanism, in my view. So and I had studied lots of stuff, and I was when I did my studies, I was always interested in the Orient, and I sort of studied yoga um, when I was in long before it turned into an industry, and I became interested in the whole idea of traditional civilizations, and I was lucky enough when I was in Bologna to go to the School of Oriental Glottology, it was called, and do some Sanskrit, and like I sort of became very interested in the whole theoretical framework, and I recognized there was an incredible sophistication in world civilizations that wasn't recognized elsewhere. And that our Western Academy didn't really recognize except in very specialist departments. So the idea began to occur to me long before I came to AUP that what I wanted to do in life was build something that would be a global communications department, which would be about a dialogue between different ways of how people conceived of communication. So in that sense, I think we were really the first to do it. We were the first to build something that was global in that sense. And at that time, Celeste and I, a bit later than that, started working on a very similar idea for the whole AUP curriculum, which was all about building, building on the legacy that we'd got from um, Lloyd Delamater, which was to deprovincialize Americans, um, and to try and find something where people found the space between cultures and to build their own capacities. So this fit for me completely in the very much in the liberal arts tradition. After all, I've been in Bologna where liberal arts began in 1066, 10, no, 1096, the first Western university where the seven liberal arts first began to taught as part of the curriculum. But the purpose of liberal arts and the purpose of understanding global civilizations are manifold. But the key one is there's a sort of space between cultures. So that fitted very well with the AUP population, you know, because we had people often who had multiple cultures, who had a Zambian father and a Zimbabwean mother and grew up in Namibia, um, of all sorts of types of cross-cultural background. And they too felt this idea of somehow the space between cultures. So that was the first thing we did. And then I think that really affected AUP culture and developed the whole model of an AUP culture, which was really about a global education, not in a very narrow sense, we just learn about other places, but where you learn about how cultures interact, which would be later taken up by my college in Complit, we around the idea of cultural translation, comparative literature, that's our slang for that. So that's how it began. On the other hand, it became it was manifestly clear to me that we needed to produce skills as well as a liberal arts education, we need to present skills that would get people jobs which would provide an edge. And um, so that edge really worked. And I, because of my background, which had been studying the theory of meaning, I realized that contemporary meaning exists in brands. People see brands in terms of they convey meaning. Nike, you know, Phil Knight said Nike is no longer a um, shoe company, it's a branding company. And so it conveys meaning, it conveys identity. And so I was interested in how that, my mega theoretical background, um, 
would link to that. The second issue in my own work was the theory of habit and the construction of how audiences work in habit and how brands work in habits and all that. So I had set up my own ideas to help shape the curriculum. It fitted with the AUP population and it fitted with the sort of growing hegemony of ideas around that time, which was about redefining liberal arts as a global liberal arts. So that's how it began. And uh, it was a great adventure. When we first came to AUP, I remember Celeste got here before me, but it was a very, um, it's much more traditional in its perception of, 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 of liberal arts, much more the grand tour. Um, and that was good. I love that. Um, you know, I, I love my colleague Francesca Weinman, who told me what I was doing was complete rubbish um, because, you know, she believed in the traditional Western canon, but, um, and only that. Uh, and she was absolutely wonderful. But times moved on and times are moving again. But that's how it began. That's how it began. And it grew very quickly. It grew very quickly. It, it sort of hit a note and it grew very quickly. And then in 10 years after that, we decided to push that model into graduate education in 2006, 2007. And that also took off and, and grew very well. Um, so voila, that's, that's the sort of history of how we got to where we are today. Um, and that's its distinctiveness, right? Its distinctiveness was really being global. I think it was the first undergraduate major called global communications in the world. And there are now hundreds. Yeah, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great that you talk about adapting to the changing times. Another great change that came in the communications world along the way was the whole digital revolution. And I know faculties everywhere and communication programs had to rethink a lot of things when that challenge came along. Do you have any recollection of how AUP went about adapting to the digital? Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing was to adapt to the analog world and Pat Thompson and I started producing video and they didn't want us to. So we sort of did it surreptitiously out of her apartment. And Kim Chakanetsa, who's joined us, was part of that, who's now a producer at the BBC, uh, was, uh, presenter at UB, the host at BBC. She was part of that. Do you remember, Kim? Well, we used to keep all the videotapes under the table, under the dining table of Pat Thompson. And we sort of started producing video with, we didn't, first we didn't have any video cameras. We did it with um, compact discs. <laughs> so we did all that. And then we moved to digital. And in terms of digital, what was interesting, we, where we're ahead of ground sort of theoretically is that we worked already on this idea of habit. And the digital is all about, in my opinion, creating habits and selling them. And so we worked in that area um, very quickly. And then my colleagues came who also were much more sophisticated in that area. And um, it was an explosion, you know, an explosion. I can remember somebody telling me that there would soon be video online. When we first began it, we had like VHS tapes and I found someone who was going to Kazakhstan and I said, can you please bring me back a BH tape of television so that we can show Jessica, I can see she was there at that time, Jessica Newman. And like now, of course, one just goes on YouTube and finds Kazakhi television immediately. Uh, my, um, Kazakh television is the right adjective. So yeah, all of that was a sudden transformation. But the theoretical underpinnings Exactly. And the Perfect. same, and the digital allowed the global to ex to become much more to our sense of interconnectedness much quicker, much faster. You know what we call time space time space compression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a matter of that underpinning and then being ready to adapt to the new landscape. Uh, as I recall, for a couple of years, it was just a collection of courses one by one that were being added on, and then. Yeah. Put together into a department and a major. And uh, at least at one point, I don't know just how it stands today, it was the second largest major, I think. Maybe it became yeah, the, yeah, it was the largest major at one point. Largest yeah. at one point. Yeah, and that happened rather quickly, which showed a, an interest, a demand for this kind of education. Another yeah. dimension that I think you helped to bring in was the uh, intercultural one, including experiences in other countries. and. Uh, Maybe comment on both of those matters, if, if that makes sense to you. 
I can't hear your last sentence, sorry. No, I just said uh, you can comment on this intercultural dimension that you insisted on, yeah. including travel to other places. Uh, oh, we did that later, yeah. First we traveled virtually, but it wasn't virtual then, but then we traveled physically. So uh, yeah, it was all very difficult politically, I can see Jim Clayson with a great library behind him, and he would remember that. See Jim again. He had to fight every way to do this, um, to get it accepted through a curriculum committee, to get accepted as a department. It was always a struggle. Um, yeah, so we started by doing this sort of cross-cultural stuff, and then AUP traditionally had done trips in Europe, and suddenly airplane travel became uh, cheaper and more possible, and we began a program in India over the Christmas break, which is just fabulous. And then we began a program, before that we even began a program in Morocco in Fez where we had connections and we took students to CARES. And those students tend to find those life-changing experiences. You know, the theory is that when you sort of have that experience, you actually lose your normal sets of coordinates of like knowing who you are in a sense. And or knowing who you think you were, because you completely a com meet a completely different culture, completely different framework, and then suddenly you have to question who you are or, or what you are, and that experience changes you. If you remember, as my president Celeste Skank is here, she may remember us doing that together under the in the rain in Willibus in the Roman ruins. As you to really. There are some key moments. So we started to produce experiential education, I would say. We moved from that to like the idea of producing experiences where we weren't just telling students what to do, but producing experiences where they could build frameworks. And that was also based on dialogue. So in Tunisia, we had colleagues in Tunisian universities and we formed teams. We had people speaking three languages and they couldn't all speak the same language, but they all had to produce a video together. Um, and that's a life-changing experience. So we were there to guide them, but also to produce this experiential model of both intercultural communication and at the same time, very practical, very uh, realistic, yeah. In building all of this, you were really able to attract a lot of other good faculty members. I think at the beginning, it was uh, people who were already teaching individual courses, in film, for example, or other fields. Or uh, I remember doing a course involved speech writing at one point, but these were one-offs. Well, you did the first course on global on global media when I first oh, arrived. Okay. You were teaching a course on global media. You you were the first, actually. Believe. It was a wonderful class because I've taught it since with all American students or mostly American students in at Northwestern and then at George Washington. But at that time, you wanted students to report on different countries to get a sense of the mix and the richness of the global scene. There was a student from 16, 18 different countries in that class, I think, who yeah. could report or experience the media close up. So it was no problem in getting a testimony about the richness we, of the global communication scene. Yeah, well, my, I used to bring colleagues from the United States in the summer, distinguished professors, to teach, and they said, I never thought you'd have 30 nationalities in a class yeah. with 20 people. That was a good, good evidence of the you know, unique strength. The AUP question was always, what passports do you have? And you did manage to bring in some full-time regular faculty members from various yeah, places. Lots. I mean, it's now, uh, there's now about 25 of us all together, full-time and part-time. So yes. that's really wrong. <laughs> yeah, so there's people from, you know, very distinguished people now, emeritus, Yudhishthir Raji Saar, who was a deputy director of um, UNESCO and now has gone on to run the Aga cult, the education sector of the Aga Khan Cultural Trust. Um, like he, he was amazing. He, he produced these five volumes on, on, on cultures and globalization funded by the Bank of Sweden. He, he was on the editorial board of producing the Encyclopedia of Global Studies. I'm an extraordinary figure, but I was also very lucky to have people like Jim Bitterman um, practical side, you know, extremely distinguished broadcast journalist um, who taught, and the beloved Pat Thompson, who was also an extremely distinguished um, uh, journalist who was no longer with us, and uh, who in a very down-home home had lived interculturally. They'd met during the Iranian Revolution and 
she'd done the interview with Gaddafi and, you know, they were good. And then Julie Thomas, who is just the most, I can go on and name them all. And after them, we started recruiting graduates out of American schools, uh, American doctoral schools, Rod Benson, who became the head of communications at NYU, then the Neil Postman's position. And uh, at the beginning with Susan Osman, who was a distinguished anthropologist, who's now heads global studies at the University of California, Riverside. Um, Adrian Russell, who heads journalism at the University of Washington. Um, so lots of people came here and then went on to produce interesting things and from there will do distinguished things. Mm -hmm. Terrific. And then of course, wonderful students were able to join undergrads who found their way into the major and and then people who came as grad students, maybe you just quickly mention the setting up of the MAGIC program. People probably know what MAGIC stands for, but it was the right word for a program that really- uh, well, That's what people it, the Master Arts of Global Communication. Well, I tried and tried, you know, and um, okay. it was a bit of Sisyphus effort that um, eventually we got there. I tried it once with the University of Westminster. I tried it with the new school when we were cooperating with them. And eventually we, we started on our own with some, I mean, I cleared it with NYU who was then becoming our partner. And uh, we built a relationship with them. And that was really just taking the same ideas and producing me on a graduate level. And that boomed for quite a while, 2006, and is doing very well still. Um, so I think it really we helped. Began yeah. thinking that we would get people who worked in Paris. You know, we did all our class at night on Saturdays, but it quickly became something that uh, American graduates wanted to do, and we moved to that market. Um, and in that, you know, I had a great partner who was Peter Barnett, who was, you know, in some ways the opposite to me, but we were great friends. And is Peter here? He's not here, but Peter was. Um, a branding executive who'd worked in some of the, you know, with WPP leading branding companies in the world. And um, he produced, he actually took over courses that I've begun and then he did his own courses on building brands and establishing brands. And is that Susan I can see there? No, Susan Fashadi. Um, but, you know, lots of people have gone on to very distinguished um, jobs in branding um, and in international organizations. Um, the list is amazing uh, of what people have done. So we took the same idea and we began it. And um, there were difference with magic and like the other year is we're a real cohort, you know? So there were 20 or 30 people who did the same degree and we did it together. Can I see Dawn Booker? I can. So Dawn went out and teach. Susan went out and worked for Todd's and, uh, and then went to Yale, is that right? I did and now I'm working at Bloomberg, so you know. Just yeah. making the rounds here. Yeah. So people went out and did really interesting things and they had a sort of edge because this was different to what other people had done. Would you agree? I mean, in your workplace. Um, and uh, Kim, who's going to speak to us soon, I think is um, Kim Chakanessa, who was one of the people who we supported with Berner and Lee, created this organization called CC, the Centre d'études de communication internationale. And uh, we developed a scholarship system to bring people from third world countries and um, if you're still allowed to use that term. And uh, Kim came and I can remember Kim teaching my class about Shona housing, how Shona is a, a ethnic group in, in Zimbabwe and she's explaining how housing works and how kinship structure worked and she'd actually lived in. So uh, CC helped us a great deal bringing in students. We brought lots of students from Cambodia at that time with Paul Slauson. We bought, you know, some of these students would arrive at AUP and didn't know how to use a Western bed, didn't know how to um, use a Western bathroom and so on. So that was really surprising. You know, next to them, you might have uh, somebody who was, we had people from the German aristocracy. We had, um, I can remember Kim telling me about visiting a Kuwaiti princess. Um, and like, so you had people from very, very different backgrounds together. Uh, That's great. One of our current, uh, uh, Sessi students, uh, Prisma, I see is on, if I'm reading the screen right, and we welcome her too. It, I think last year we celebrated our 20th anniversary of the center of programs. And the center does lectures from time to time. It invites students 
including my classes from the United States, to come to spend a week in Paris seminars. And then it sponsors these scholarships, which began with Paul Slauson, who was chairman of the board, who talked me into my interim role at AUP, uh, my interim full-time role. And uh, that all has been going for 20 years, and we had a big celebration last June, just about this time last year, I guess, although under different circumstances. And I don't know, I think maybe some of the other SESI students, I may have missed them on my screen, but uh, it's good that they're continuing to, to tune into all of this. Uh, maybe you mentioned, Wadik, that, that Kim was prepared to say something, and I think it'd be wonderful to hear more from her yeah. about her career and what, what, what her plans look like now. It's been a terrific, we've always pointed to it as a wonderful uh, example. Well, uh, go ahead, Wadik. Yeah. Now, just let me introduce Kim, if Kim's going to speak a little. Kim came to AUP, did her BA there, and survived uh, with all the difficulties of living in Paris, came from Zimbabwe, and um, then went from AUP to Oxford, where she won the prize for the best, the Terence Ranger Prize for best master's thesis in, in African studies. She later went to Columbia University, got a scholarship to Columbia University to do journalism. She won what I think was called the CNN Prize, and now uh, runs two shows on the BBC. It's the presenter of two shows, very well known uh, um, presenter. Um, so has gone to a very distinguished career after AUP. Um, and Maybe we should ask Kim to talk a little bit about what it was, what it was to do communications at AUP. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for having me. Um, Professor Dewey, just listening to you, I felt like I was back in your class. I should be sitting up straight and taking notes. <laughs> um, so just to explain my slightly strange surroundings, I'm actually in a duvet studio because I'm not, we're not allowed in at the BBC at the moment because obviously they're trying to keep people at a minimum um, within the offices and studios. So I've created a duvet fortress where I do all my recordings because um, it helps to absorb the sound. So this is why it's a bit strange um, where I'm coming from today. So I, when I came to AUP, I immediately took to it because I think what really appealed to me straight away was the size of the university. And I pretty much knew everyone almost immediately. And there's something really joyful about being able to walk from Mukhe to Bosquet and you can say hi to at least 10 people. And you're meeting people from countries that you've only ever seen on the map. And I know people say that to me coming from Zimbabwe, which is a very small country, which people often <laughs> have, you know, really heard about. Um, and I first came to Professor Dole's class when I took his communications and history class. Um, I even still have the book. There we go. <laughs> well thumbed. I still read it. <laughs> and, um, oh, it's a cliche to say, um, but Professor Dole is a fountain of knowledge. He was also very intimidating. Um, in class because he expects you to do your readings and to show up and you know and he wants you to think for yourself and it was a bit of a challenge for me coming from Zimbabwe where it's all about not parrot learning but you're not expected to have uh, viewpoints um, so that was very good for me just in terms of academically trying to sort of expand and not just regurgitate um, arguments and that class that I took um, that communication to history class turned out to be the most important class I've ever taken. And I know that sounds dramatic, um, uh, but at the time when I was taking that class, I was basically running out of funds. I had ambitiously thought that I could somehow work and pay my way through university. Um, and as I was leaving class, Professor Doyle always would always inquire about everyone's well-being. It wasn't just about you know, how you know how you were doing in class, but also how you were. Um, he asked me about my plans and I said that I might have to leave. Um, and that was the start of a very long journey where Professor Doyle brought together a network of people to help me get through university. And my dream was always to work in radio, um, which I do now um, for the BBC. But I would not be anywhere where I am if it wasn't for Professor Doyle, for Bernard Hubner, Lee Hubner, Mary Slauson, Ceci, the Newmans, Jessica, I don't know if you're here, um, who championed me all the way. And I have no doubt that for me, at least, if I had been at a bigger university, I really do think I would have been lost in the system. And for me, AUP has just been so instrumental into getting me where I am today. And I, I felt like I was always surrounded by family. Um, Berna <laughs> and Lee always um, 
there to you know to help me with any any questions any you know any any things that I needed I I, I really am so grateful um, to AUP and I just felt that it set me on the road academically and also just in every possible way so I, it's hard for me to sort of articulate without getting emotional about how you know important AUP has been to me and Professor Doyle and Lee and Gurn and all the people who helped me get to where I am today so I can just use this platform to say thank you very much and I, I yeah I, I, there's not much more I could say other than that yeah. um, thank you I, I know the program's been really proud of your success and it exemplified a lot of other former students the very first students were from Cambodia uh, Paul and Mary Slauson had deep involvements in Cambodia and uh, funded the program at the start 20 years ago uh, enormous contribution, not just to the SESI program, but to AUP in general. I don't think the school would exist if it hadn't been for their generosity at that time. Uh, and then lots of things came along, the momentum built, and Wadik was a key to that, as uh, others, other heroes have been since. Um, any other students who are on call? I'm, uh, oh, I, I noticed that Pamela Spurden is on, and when I mentioned the uh, early days of SESI and these programs at somebody else who should be recognized. Um, I think Norman is supposed to be on. Yeah. Dawn Booker went on to teach. Norman, there you are. So. Yes. Oh, I see Norman, great. Mm -hmm. uh, hello. Hello, and I think Stella is also on. Alums. So, Monica, thank you so much for, for putting this group together. This is amazing, or, or AUP, for putting this group together. It's so amazing to see everyone. I did, as Wadik said, I did have the, I, I am teaching adjunct, and I have had the opportunity to come back and teach in the MAGIC program to teach um, strategic communications as a module. But I also started a business, um, uh, a travel business for women of color to encourage them to travel internationally. Um, my experience living in, and matriculating in Paris really um, transformed my idea of what a global business looks like. And so I have brought a group of women to Paris. I've bought, taken a group of women to South Africa, Morocco, um, Bali, Indonesia. And for me, uh, my journey, my global journey started at AUP and with the MAGIC program. So I'm eternally grateful to this program. I'm still marketing consulting and still doing the things that I was doing before I came. I was significantly older than my classmates, but for me, it was a, a transformative experience in my 40s. So I'm, I'm grateful to have had that experience and to attribute that experience to um, Professor Doyle and Payne and, and others who um, just really supported me, as Kim said, supported me from day one. I have never felt more supported in an environment than at, um, at AUP, so I'm, I'm grateful for that experience. That's great. Are there other students who, uh, I mentioned Prisma earlier, who comes from Nepal? Oh, oh. Hi, Professor. Hi, everybody. Yes, I'm here. Very good. And Prisma has been here for the last year or so, I think. And uh, yes, it's been a been, year. Great. And then uh, Narman's from Libya, and is uh, hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Leaving her work for this next year, I think. Yes. So basically, thank you, everyone, for this great um, conference. Um, basically, if I want to comment on AUP or CC, I wouldn't have enough words to express how much they had impact on my life. And basically, Professor Doyle was the first um, professor who I took class with um, in my master's degree. And he was also the first person helping me with the uh, solving the problem of being unable to pay my tuition and fees and he put me in a contact with the cc team because um i am a, i have it happened to escape the war in libya and i was i was unable to pay my tuition and fees then i talked to professor doyle and he was like the person who helped me um basically 
with CC to get the uh, scholarship. And um, what's unique about Professor Doyle um, teaching style or either his personality is that he, what he's doing is more than only teaching us. He's, he's, he's trying to open our eyes on so many things about life. So um, he's a professor with, for so many aspects and so many subjects. I remember that the first assignment in his class um, was like he, he's asking us doing reports and trying to learn about different countries, uh, the journalism system in different countries. So I was like interested in searching about Qatar. Other students were like interested in searching about like Kenya or um, Venezuela or so we get to learn from each other and from his class so many things about journalism, freedom of speech that we wouldn't have the chance to learn about if we were in another class or with another professor. So it was so unique. And also that the fact that he's showing interest in his classes in his, with the, for his students. So when he knew that I'm from Libya, he started talking with me about the history of the country that I couldn't learn much about in the school because of the Gaddafi regime. Um, we only learned the history that he created. So things that he did. So I was missing like everything that was before him. And Professor Doyle gave me a book that taught me about the history of my country. So he's a person with so many talents, that's to say, it's the minimum things that we could say about him, is that he's really, he knows about everything and he wants his students to know about everything as well. So it's a really something that it's valuable. And, so, and he also give, like, he cares a lot about his students in a way that he talks with us about our future, that I see like it's really humanitarian in a way that it's so humane that he's really giving us that time and also advice to show us where to go and what to do and what's best for us. So it wouldn't happen if I, if, if I haven't met Professor Doyle to continue my master's degree because he brought me in a connection with the great family, the CC family. So they changed a huge, they made a huge impact in my life and it, until the moment. So I really appreciate everything you have done for me guys. And I hope that one day I will be able to um, also give back all these huge gifts. Thank you so much. For everything. Thank you. Darman, oh, please. Back oh. right along. Maybe Wada can comment on this. Darman won a major, wonderful prize at graduation this last uh, month. Yeah, she so. won the prize from her fellow students for service to, to other students. So, despite her house being bombed, despite her house being in civil war, her country being in civil war, she was able to spend time thinking of other people. There are so many other people here I'd like to hear from. I, I want to jump in for one second here and just say that Norman, who did win this very uh, prestigious and wonderful uh, prize from her classmates and the university, is also already beginning sort of the virtual cycle of giving back to AUP because she's going to start, or maybe you've already started, Norman, as an intern in the housing office welcoming new graduate students to AUP. Everybody knows that it's really challenging to come to Paris and come to this program, and she will be creating an easier pathway forward for these, these new students who are so excited to welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I think as is evident here, Wadik is not only close to the students who are now studying, but he stayed in more than many faculty members in touch with alumni from the program. Yeah. SESI group has a sort of alumni mm. uh, quality too. One example of that is uh, I think Stella, who's on the call uh, coming yeah. to us from Nairobi, was recommended by a former student uh, about 15, 20 years ago, Wanja. Uh, so uh, the cause continues on. I was going to ask Wanja, well, the time we have left, if you wanted to comment any more about your own non teaching, your own research work, and your own projects. Wow. and. I think your role at AUP has extended beyond the communications field into educational innovation oh, and other fields as well. Model and so on. Well, you know, um, you have to adapt between what's ideal and what you can do. I mean, 
I went to Italy. I wanted to study semiotics. I knew that when I was 19, and I sort of worked after I graduated from my BA for a while um, in the Australian federal government, federal democracy. And then I left. I got a scholarship to go to Italy, which is what I really wanted to do. And in Italy, I really discovered, bizarrely enough, India, which I was very interested in. And I probably would have liked, had I to sort of pursue that. I wanted to come to Paris to pursue the studies of Sanskrit philosophy of language, but no one was interested in that. No one would give you a job with that. So I, and I had to go back to Australia for family reasons. So I wrote a PhD on the history of television. And that was all about habit, how audiences are constructed by habit. And that quickly came into politics because Berlusconi was really someone who managed to control. He was a, in many ways a precursor of Donald Trump who managed to build and manage audiences and shift audiences from one position to another. He was much more subtle about it and much more like, but he shifted the sort of language of television uh, into, into media, but not only the language, the techniques of counter-programming. So I moved from that very arcane area to something very practical and then went into branding. And recently my academic work has moved away from all of that to thinking about that in a more abstract way in terms of the digital era. So I wrote a book with my colleague Claudio Roda last year that came out last year, which was called, um, let me think, um, Attention Scarcity in the Digital Era. So I'm now interested in the problem of attention, you know. So our most valuable thing that any human being has is where they place their attention. It's a sort of bank account where we put our attention. And that actually is a theory that came from my Indian days, but now it goes and applies to digitalization and how that works. I can see Anne Malhota there, right? Hi, Anne. So, and French, Hi. but an Indian background, but uh, you probably know yes. the word Bashan, you know? Yes. Uh, it's about looking and how you look. So that idea, the, uh, I've now been producing that in a digital framework and bizarrely enough, the practical application I work on that is linked to branding. How brand, brands now grab human attention, shift human attention from one thing to another, and how brands have become a system in some ways of government, of how you govern people, how politicians have become brands, uh, more than anything else, uh, or many politicians, perhaps not all, uh, and how they construct themselves as brands. So, you know, I've done a lot on political branding. I've done, uh, I've done this very theoretical work about attention and uh, and I've continued to work on the history of um, of media in France and, and Italy. Uh, that's my personal work. And now I have a gig at AUP, I mean, sorry, I have a position where I'm uh, working on academic innovation, trying to work on academic innovation, developing new programs and, and, and new ideas of how to deal with it. So we have now a committee we're about to form about imagining the university in the post-COVID world um, and trying to think how things will change because of course um, this is an example of our new world is that we're all talking on Zoom and we're all everywhere all over the world and we have this framework of a new relationship between the local and the global. Is Jessica still with us? Is Jessica Newman still with us? Hillary? Bitai, are they still with us? Or they had to go. I can't see Jessica. Yes, I'm still here, and Jessica is too. <laughs> yeah, hi, Jessica. So Jessica was my alum at the, uh, you know, was alum from the very beginning of the program. I think she was in the first course I taught at AUP, and Jessica has gone on to do the most remarkable things. Jessica has built this organization worldwide. Um, charity organization that works with the equestrian industry and uh, and looks after children of the poorest children in the world, those who work in dumps. So Jessica has gone on to build schools in Guatemala, in, um, in Cambodia, in Honduras, am I right? Uh, and, yeah. And, and it's simply, she's devoted her life to that and uh, we're so proud of that. So thank you for coming, Jessica. I don't know if you want to say anything. Uh, sure. I, well, I put it in the chat, but both Hillary and I actually met in your class 
and just saying how incredibly inspirational you always have been and taught us to question ourselves, our beliefs, our values and everything, which is I think what led us both, interestingly enough, like Hillary and I went through college together and then at a certain point reconnected, I had quit my riding career Hillary was on maternity leave and we hooked back up and co-founded Just World. And all that I think was based on those values that came out of our time at AUP and so much of your influence. And in those first years, Cambodia was our first project. And I remember you even came with us and mm -hmm. that just inspired us to grow. And yes, I'm an equestrian uh, originally and it is a very affluent community around the world. And so we, not only do we raise funds and awareness through it, but actually we were just saying, uh, we're working with AUP on developing a great leadership program. We already have been doing one, but we're working more closely because the youth are really the future of tomorrow. And especially in the positions that they have, it's more than ever now, they have to make more socially responsible decisions and be more socially responsible human beings. Yeah, if I can just interrupt, I think the greatest gift any student can give to somebody who teaches them is to pass on. I mean, I had the most extraordinary teachers, some were famous intellectuals like Umberto Eco and Paolo Fabri, and some were not so famous, but were just wonderful teachers, such as David Saunders. And all one can hope is that one's students take on that, maybe as professors as Dawn has, or, or um, another student who's at Oxford now, uh, Julia Lefkowitz, uh, teaching at the Internet Institute. But the most important thing is to transmit that to another generation and to try to keep that going. And that is the essence, really, of liberal arts education is that set of transmission. And unfortunately, uh, it's very expensive to do but it's the key to human transformation, I think, is that idea. That's really what tradition is. You is that tradition where you adapt what you learn to your epoch from your teachers and your students keep doing that. So I'm very, okay, very I, I, I just have to jump in here. What a, that was just the most fabulous line and the story from Jessica and Hillary. I, I have to come in right now with a, an advertisement. Um, first of all, we have seen on this call 52 people who are together in the AUP community and surrounding the result of the, the future because of Waddock Doyle. So first I want to say a big thank you. And you, you will have the last word, Waddock, so don't worry about that. But really, just this is so fabulous. I've written down so many questions here. But the idea of losing your coordinates and the sense of who you are that takes place at AUP, that just defines us. and catapult AUP alumni out into the world, Jessica and Hillary and, and Dawn and everybody to make the world a better place. So, so thank you for that. And I also love the, the line you said, where else are you going to find 30 nationalities in a class with 20 people only at AUP? Um, I, I have a, a pitch and an advertisement before I ask you one last question. First of all, it is expensive, and so you even made my pitch for me. Thank you, Wadik. Um, liberal arts education is based on the connection between teachers and students that takes place usually in the classroom, but even this spring we've learned via Zoom and, and Teams and GoToMeeting that it's still every single one of our students that stayed in the game finished the semester. That's amazing, and that's because our faculty members turned on a dime on March 18th and turned us into a digital campus. And since then, we've learned that, that we can do this too, although we can't wait to be back in Paris. So I'd like to ask you if there are many people on this call who have been supportive of the university and these programs. And I'd, I'd like to just say, as I have the last few times, if, if your circumstances permit, please consider supporting the university as we come to the close of a very expensive fiscal year, even more expensive than usual, thanks to some of the innovations that we have had to build and will build in the future. And, and you'll be hearing We'll put a link in the chat now and you'll hear more from us over, this over the next few days, but please support us if you're able. Thank you very much. We have two programs next week in the AUP to you program. We have on, on, on Tuesday, Maria Bach, an alum now faculty member who is now teaching in the economics department, who's going to talk about how economics is changing the world. She's going to talk about her research, bring some students as, as, as Wadick has done today and, and really talk about her experience as an alum 
graduate of two, 2008, I think, now teaching at the university. Then on Thursday, Lindsay Tremuda will talk about her new book. She's written some really wonderful books and a blog on living in Paris. And she's going to, she's going to be our alumni feature. And, and the AUPDU program will close on Monday, July 13th with a community reception before Bastille Day with Celeste. But before we close this, so please join us if you can, more information on the website. Before we close this, Wada, um, I warned you of this and, and maybe others want to be a part of this. We always like to close with what's one thing you want us to take away besides the fact that AUP is transformative. I'll take that as your answer if you'd like. But what's one thing that you would like to say about global communications and, and your work really to change the world that we can all use as your evangelist when we go out from here, when we go off to our Zoom cocktail parties or to porch parties with friends? What's, what's one thing we should know? Well, the one thing you should know, but I, I've seen some people, I didn't realize you were here, Maria Lani, who's a communications professor in Stockholm. I've seen that Pamela Spurden is here, who was my first master's student before we got into the master's program, who was in AUP's original cohort. So thank you for coming. And, and both of them went on to teach. Pamela went to teach in Cambodia um, at the Royal University of Phnom Penh. And Marie teaches at a school in, in Stockholm. The most important thing is to not want the last word. That's what democracy is all about. That's what liberal education is, to not want the last word. So I don't want the last word. Would someone else like the last word? Marie or um, Pamela? Can I jump in? Sure, who's that? It's Monique. Oh. I just wanted to drive home that point. I know it's already been said about um, the trips. Uh, but I think I've been on more AUP trips uh, than anyone else. Uh, I did. I only just finished the degree, like Naman. Just, just, just graduated, right? Uh, well, I just finished the courses. I still have to do an internship to officially graduate. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been to Fez with Professor Doyle. I've been to Istanbul, and I've been to Rajasthan. Um, yeah, alumni. Honestly. Alumni trips with Wadik needs to be a thing because I mean, just wow. Like, <laughs> I don't know how many of you all have traveled with him, but it is truly an adventure. It, like no matter what's been planned, Wadik always has something else going on that's maybe better. Um, he's, you know, endlessly entertaining. And he is, you know, we were calling him Papa Wadik in the last trip because he really is you do feel that he cares for your well-being just as a person. Like Narman said, you are a true humanitarian and everybody who knows you, all of your students, I mean, you might not be famous in the traditional sense, but you are for sure famous around the world um, just for being yourself. You know, it's not, I mean, yes, you are a professor and you've taught us a lot, but really you have a unique light um, that everybody can see and feel, even total strangers when you drop your passport on the airplane, like you are getting anywhere you want to, you need to be <laughs> exactly when you're supposed to be there, whether it was planned or not. So I'm eternally grateful to you for all these trips and all the courses. And I'm still mulling over things that I've learned in class that I didn't fully grasp at the time. It's applying to my life and I'm a better person after being a, one of your students. Well, you better go out and succeed. We want you to achieve now. <laughs> now, right? You don't have to say that. I mean, you've got to go and get there in the world and, and, and achieve and use it to benefit others as well. Yeah, I'm working on it. So thank you. Thank you so much for that, Monique. Uh, very touching. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of chatter, and everybody take a look at the chat box. There's a lot of chatter now. We clearly have some alumni trips with Wadik on the boards, and I don't think it's just because we're all we'd like to go anywhere. It's really your genuine affection and regard for you, oh, Wadik. One thing I haven't said: nothing in the graduate program would have happened, but for Sinead Foley. Uh, Sinead was here. Helped me. Uh, who did everything for me? Who was always there? And. Um, Thank my um, my gratitude to her is infinite. And we have a prospective student on the line today. Hannah, I'm going to read yours out and say, as a prospective student, it's great to hear the appreciation alumni have. Oops, I've just moved here. Alumni have for their tutors. I'm sold. Well, 
So you're doing it all, Waddock, recruiting, making sure people get through, deeping, developing these lifelong relationships. And Hannah, that is AUP. AUP at its best is right here. It's one o'clock, we say one hour, and I would just like to thank our two presenters today. We were lucky enough to have not only Waddock, but also the fabulous Lee Hebner to lead our discussion, showing, a, again, decades of, of, of relationship here. He brought Waddock to AUP. He now is so important to the university and to the CC program, about which I hope you will all learn more, too. But thank you. Thank you both so much. Holly, are you there? Holly, can you share the photo of everyone, all the magic students having breakfast at my house? Is Holly still there? Yes. One second. Maybe end on that. <laughs> so this was what we did for our 10th year anniversary, and hopefully we'll do another one soon. Here we go. Oh, there you are. Oh, look at everybody that! Up. Everybody, a lot of us having Fantastic. breakfast. Fantastic. Nice. Yeah. That's great. So we're a community, and let's keep the community going. And those of you who want to come and join this community, you're very welcome. Great. Thank you so much. And with that, I believe, uh, uh, Lee, any last words? I think we're adjourned. Well, Anything else? Many, many thanks. And people can read the chat box if they haven't already. It's, yes. it's a tribute box today, I think. Mm -hmm. Including, Mo Monique is looking for an internship. Thank you, Jessica. You noticed that. So you two need to connect. But anybody who has a thought for Monique, she's pretty terrific, as you can tell. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks to all. Thank you, Wada. Thank you. Thank you.